The possibility of changing consciousness was discovered in the Orient 2,500 years ago, at least, probably it's older than that. But techniques were discovered to quiet the mind, pacify the mind, remove emotional compulsions, and these were organized into the science of yoga. As John Lilly says, yoga is the science of the East, as science is the yoga of the West. to the Hilaritas Podcast, brought to you by Hilaritas Press. I am your host, Mike Gathers. Join us as we explore the world of iconic writer Robert Anton Wilson and the people and ideas who influenced him. On our last episode, Adam Go Rightly took time to chat with us about Discordian co-founder Carrie Thornley. And today we chat with flotation enthusiast, entrepreneur, consultant, and publisher Graham Tallett about physician, neuroscientist, psychoanalyst, psychonaut, philosopher, writer, and inventor John C. Lilly, MD. Visit us at hilaritaspress.com slash podcast for show notes, links, and past episodes. And while you're out and about on the internet, Please help us find the others by hitting the thumbs up, subscribing, rating, reviewing, and or sharing the Hilaritas podcast. It helps more than you might think. As we continue to follow Bob's journey through Cosmic Trigger, we find Bob the Shaman confronting a deeper and deeper net of coincidences as he starts incorporating metaprogramming techniques into his psychedelic, yogic, and magical experiments. Among those tools was John Lilly's metaprogramming script, Beliefs Unlimited which you'll find links to in the show notes. On July 23rd of 1973, these experiments led Bob deep down a rabbit hole with the Dog Star Sirius and the number 23, taking him into and eventually through the trials of Chapel Perilous. And with all that said, I'm super excited to introduce our guest for this episode, entrepreneur and float enthusiast, Graham Talley. Graham Talley, welcome to the Laritas podcast. Yeah, yeah, thanks again so much for, for having me here. Yeah, glad to have you. And so why don't we start out, you can tell us a little about yourself and, and how you're involved and in, in how you came to know John Lilly. Yeah, for sure. So got interested in John Lilly actually through Float Tank, so one of his kind of major contributions to humanity, which is something that I've been doing for the last about 11, 12 years here in Portland, Oregon, is actually running a, a six tank float tank center. And through that, we kind of started doing a bunch of other things that were related in the float tank world. So the last a little over a decade of my life has, uh, when I'm feeling pithy, I say it's been spent doing nothing. <laughs> but really, yeah. it's like the most professional form of nothing possible. So, you know, running the float tank center, we also started up a big international float tank conference started up a little music publishing company for float inspired music. Mm -hmm. And one of the other things we did was actually start up a publishing company for books related to float tanks or lily tanks as they used to be called in the day or sensory deprivation tanks. And through that process, uh, you know, we published some of our own books. We, we got really interested in doing some creative projects and seeing, for instance, what art came out of the float tank or again, our, our music publishing company kind of started as this project of what music comes out of the float tank and in that process, I also kind of realized, you know, got deep into reading John Lilly. My background before float tanks was in experimental psychology. Mm. So that was actually kind of what led me to float tanks in the first place was I started reading research papers on them and just got so entranced with this idea that there are these things out there that are so beneficial that no one knows about. And the same thing really drew me to John Lilly was, you know, he, like myself, is uh, would, would consider himself, I'm sure, one of the, the deepest psychonauts out there. I don't, I don't uh, hold that mantle, but very interested in that side, but also very interested in the, the psychology, the science of it. And as we'll learn, you know, and even, even among uh, people who are PhDs and kind of in this psychonautic world, uh, he was considered the, the scientist among them, right? Kind of the most rigorously academically trained. And yeah, that really drew me to his works. I found out in the process that programming and metaprogramming in the human biocomputer had actually been out of print for quite a while, you know, over 25 years. And there were versions of it that were kind of cut down, edited versions, which if you see something called, uh, you know, programming in the human biocomputer, that's not the original 
text that he wrote. And I just I just considered it kind of a travesty that, that so many people had not read this this really milestone work by this amazing scientist. And as I'm sure we'll talk about too, like so many others, you know, Timothy Leary and Ram Dass kind of got discredited from the academic scene largely based on his work with with psychedelics. So uh, yeah, I had the privilege of working with his estate to actually bring that back into print and do a modern version of it. And yeah, from there, we published Center of the Cyclone, and uh, we're actually just in the process of publishing a hardcover version of The Scientist with some new images that people haven't seen, got to travel down to his archive down in Stanford and do a bunch of research down there through his, his old images and journals and things like that, which is really fun. So uh, yeah, kind of just started again into John Lilly, firstly through float tanks, secondly through kind of the psychology of psychedelics, and uh, yeah, then just from there fell completely in love with him and his, his life philosophy. That's fantastic. I realized that programming and metaprogramming in the human biocomputer had been out of print, and I didn't realize it had been 25 years, but I picked up a copy two years ago when the, the pandemic started and was really thankful to have that, and great to see it back in print. Well, thanks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The the people we've been studying lately, we, we, we hardly even cover the whole thing, I think, because there's so much to him, and, and John Lilly is no exception to that. So if we were to start out maybe with his early childhood, what could you tell us about that? Sure. Well, I guess to go back even further, you know, he starts his own autobiography, um, which he calls a novel autobiography, with the line, the star maker stirred. And then he goes back to uh, pretty much the beginning of the entire universe. Um, it reminds me of the old, uh, I think it's Carl Sagan joke, you know, to, to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first create the universe. But apparently in writing his own autobiography, John Lilly also starts at the, the formation of our very universe and then builds up to this entity that is John Lilly, which is really funny. So, I mean, just the fact he'd introduce himself that way, I think, tells a lot about him. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so he grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota. He was born in 1915. And then, uh, yeah, died in 2001. And he, kind of from the beginning, you know, he was always known as uh, the, the almost mischievous scientific kid, right? Mm -hmm. So he'd do things like his brother was playing uh, basketball with friends, and he'd be making, like, a small contained pipe bomb <laughs> in his garage <laughs> and, like, throw it next to the, his brother and their friends, and it would explode, and they'd all get really scared, right? He came from a really wealthy family, so he kind of had this passion of science taken care of for him for a very long time and was provided, you know, like chemistry sets that are probably illegal to give to kids now and all that kind of yeah. kind of fun materials. And from the beginning was really, I think, just considered a genius, even among his family and friends and, and teachers. And he kind of had this, this challenge with that throughout his life as well, uh, this balance between coming with a really well-to-do family and having things provided and him feeling this need to make his own way and not really especially make use of his dad's influence, who was a very prominent banker. I think it was the first national bank that his father ran. And his brother ended up going into the, the finance industry as well, later his younger brother. Uh, but yeah, so grew up there had kind of a, a pretty rural life in a lot of ways. So did things like, you know, riding horses, helping to set up the like local radio broadcast center from scratch, you know, building the entire thing and setting up the radio mm -hmm. tower. So a lot of a lot of interesting endeavors like that. I mean, again, it's, you know, uh, not that far after the turn of the, the last century that he was he was growing up here right after World War One. From there, he went off to Caltech was his first uh, kind of undergraduate that he went to. And from there, just kind of branched out. So went to medical school, um, went out to Dartmouth, and then went to, oh gosh, what was his alma mater after that? The University of Pittsburgh? Oh boy, I'm going to space out on the, the last place where he got his, uh, some of his PhD work in. But really rigorously trained, you know, at the, at the end of his life, his uh, doctor famously said that John Lilly is one of those few people who, being a medical doctor, was one of the least of their accomplishments, right? Yeah, and so really, I think a lot of the things that people don't know about John Lilly, which uh, which is is massive. Again, um, just like Timothy Leary and and so many other people, I think from that era, there's these rumors that go around, and the rumors are so much more prevalent than people who have actually read his work or listened to what he's saying. That I think there's a bunch of misconceptions about who John Lilly is, and people don't realize that he was for a long time considered one of the top scientists in the country, you know, and, and greatest thinkers. So he developed the early 3D brain scans, like the first kind of 3D brain scanners we had were John Lilly. Wow. You know, if you, um, you know, more famously, uh, if you know about dolphin intelligence and kind of attempts to communicate with dolphins, um, John Lilly was the one pioneering 
dolphin research and even the idea that dolphins are more than just big fish, right, and are these intelligent mammals that, that live in the ocean. Uh, developed a lot, a lot of lab studies for working with high-altitude pilots and simulating different intakes of uh, chemicals and gases and things like that. Really just an amazing, amazing scientist. And then, of course, later on got into developing float tanks, kind of got deep into the psychedelia world, which I think is why we don't know so much about all of the other, the other things. Yeah. So that was more, I guess, than his early life, but kind of a whirlwind through some of his, his accomplishments. Oh, and I guess just as a, a side note to back that one up is I, I think he wrote, uh, let's see, 13 books through his life, maybe 15, and uh, published around 125 scientific papers of which he was only co-author of maybe a few. So I, I want to say somewhere between three and five um, was he the secondary author on, I should say, not the primary author on those right. 125 uh, research papers, which is not a bad, uh, yeah, not a bad stint for a scientist that only practiced for a few decades before going off on his own path. Then was that where he discovered psychedelics and things changed? Or what was the catalyst in the, in the direction of the new path? Yeah, so he was doing a lot of work for the National Institute of Health, and I guess it's worth going back to talk a little bit about one of the major through lines of John Lilly's life, you know, which was really trying to understand uh, consciousness and what this mm. external world is. Essentially, is everything just being created in our brain, or is there some kind of external world that is actually out there, and what does it look like? Right, he basically wanted to solve uh, like Descartian duality, Right, the 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 mind body uh, right. dualism difference, and so his his since a, a young age he was interested in that, and he had spiritual experiences from a young age as well. I would call them spiritual. He might call them uh, something else. Right. Uh, so he remembers, for instance, going going. Uh, I think one of his first kind of sexual experiences is on his. Uh, uh, it's like one of those. I, I don't, we don't really have them anymore, but like um, like self exercise machines, like jiggling machines, almost like you put a little rope or like band around you. You know, and it like right. jiggles your body. And so young John Lilly is in one of those <laughs> and just is like, you know, kind of having one of his first like orgasmic experiences. Um, but for him, that orgasm turned into like actually seeing angels descend down and, and start talking mm. to him. Right. Um, and later on, he was re to refer to these as um, kind of the, the, the entities or the three entities. Um, of which he, he ends up being one of them. Spoilers, <laughs> if you haven't read Center <laughs> of the Cyclone yet. And so same thing, right? So he goes into church, he's hearing all this stuff about how masturbation is evil. And his experiences in church sometimes would involve things like the entire ceiling of the church breaking open and actually seeing angels descending through it. And so at some point, he was just like, hey, if this thing that I'm feeling is evil, then like the church has no idea what's going on and walked out and never went back. And this is like young teenage John Lilly. If you can imagine someone who's that disciplined of mind to say, I don't care what religion I was raised in, forget it. I'm out of here. This goes against my own personal experience, right. right? And that's so much of John Lilly's life is basically fighting for us to pay more attention to our personal experiences and him going as deep down that, that rabbit hole as he could, you know? It seems like somebody that has like really profound experiences, like just by his very nature and then gets very curious about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And especially you can imagine with the kind of brain that he had on him, you know, you're having these experiences and then you're studying science very rigorously. And you're both saying, hey, there's no room in the science of the 1940s, of the science of the 1950s, especially, you know, to explain what I'm going through. I want to try and figure that out um, mm. as, as rigorously and scientifically as possible is how he started. And so his, his kind of ideal plan was to put tens of thousands, if not, you know, millions of probes inside his brain and capture his own brain uh, and capture all of the electrical signals going through that uh, for, you know, a period of 15 minutes or an hour, and then be able to, through the same probes, play back that same signal of what he experienced and see then if his subjective experience of that playback is the exact same as when he was going through it initially. Um, so he basically wanted a way, and later on he kind of corrected himself and said, hey, there's so many electrical impulses going through other parts of our brain, you know, we might have these things called the gut biome, is that starting to come out? He's like, maybe we couldn't actually figured this out with the right chemicals and electronics to be able to fully monitor and, and play back what's going on for a human. But a lot of his early work, when it was self-directed and he actually had his own laboratory, was pretty much going in that direction to how do I lead up to putting these tens of thousands of probes into my own brain so that I can do this experiment to prove whether or not subjective reality is real or whether there's something on top of it, you know? Hmm. It's fascinating to hear how some of these early pioneers explore the mystery and 
and really try to unpack it and understand it. And it makes me wonder what they would have to say with today's modern tools and technology. Yeah, for sure. Right. I mean, now we have, yeah, actually advanced brain scanners that don't need, um, yeah, inserting probes into the brain, for example, but we're still so far away from that idea of what John Lilly wanted. So he, he took that, right? I guess the, the full kind of arc of his career is he took that. And that is where we got the early 3D brain scanners. So we st he started doing research with monkeys, with dolphins, kind of never progressed past that. And uh, I guess donkeys were another one that got experimented on, not so much <laughs> by him, but his technology used by the military. And so there's some there's some funny stories here, you know, as long as we're, ne we're never going to delve even halfway through John Lilly's life. So we'll focus on some of the interesting things that happen along the way, right? So he's doing these, these early 3D brain scans, right? And he's actually figured out a way at this point. Um, this is a little later in his career now. And he's figured out a way to insert probes into monkeys to experiment with them and different depths, right? So this is why I say 3D brain scanning and actually like 3D input control as well, because these probes, pretty much electrical probes, would be going through the skull, eventually had little sheaths. Um, so he'd kind of uh, put this like whole sheath into the, uh, the monkey head. And then you can insert probes all across it. So it'd be, you know, going through. And then you can remove the probes and still have these little sheaths that allow access to the different levels of the monkey brain to play around with. And so he'd be recording impulses. He'd be shooting electronic signals into the, the brain of the monkey to play around and try to identify the topography of the brain, essentially, what controls what. You know, here's the, the motor cortex. You know, here's the part that seems to be in charge of uh, scent. And then... As a funny byproduct to this, uh, which gets into dolphin research as well, you know, he kind of ca categorized the sexual areas of the brain into three different areas as well. So there was kind of arousal, um, sexual pleasure, and orgasm was the three general areas of sexual arousal that at that time he had kind of captured in the, the monkey brain. And so he ends up as one of his experiments hooking up an orgasm button basically for these monkeys so they can do whatever they want they have food you know they're they're in their cage and stuff and then they can also just hit this orgasm button whenever they want to right and so the monkeys would pretty much <laughs> what they do is wake up hit the orgasm button for about 16 hours a day and then go back to sleep <laughs> you know like <laughs> exhausted and happy um to the point where they were not being healthy like they they weren't really eating their hair was starting to fall off, like they weren't taking care of themselves, you know, but they were just so addicted to this uh, kind of one of the greatest pleasures that us mammals can experience, right? On the flip side, they also did another one where you had this button that uh, you could push it and it would prevent nausea, basically. So um, it would stop the probe from giving the monkey this kind of nauseated feeling. So every 20 minutes, I think, or so, they had to um, hit the button. Maybe it was every 10 minutes or they'd, they'd kind of get this wave of nausea. And... For the monkeys with that one, they would hit the button, you know, go about their business, um, 10 minutes would pass, they'd hit the button again, and then they couldn't really do anything else. Like, they wouldn't go far away from the button, they wouldn't, uh, mm. they, they would, like, lose sleep, right? They'd, like, wake up from sleep, hit the button, try to go back to sleep for 10 minutes, etc., and couldn't really cope with it. And same thing, it led to this, like, very unhealthy lifestyle for, for the monkeys, you know? And so... Fast forward a little bit more from there. He's been doing these 3D brain scans. He hears that maybe the closest brains that there are mammalian brains to humans are not monkeys, but dolphins. So later on, he tried the same experiment with dolphins, which is uh, kind of led to some, some very different results, you know. So he'd heard that the human brain perhaps is even more similar to dolphin brains than it is to that of a monkey, right? Um, kind of for the size of the prefrontal cortex, things like that. And so he went out, um, he actually, you know, caught some dolphins in the wild, did autopsies on them, uh, which later on in his life, by the way, he said was one of his largest regrets was capturing those dolphins and, and doing autopsies because he considered it uh, essentially like doing the same thing for human beings, right? And so he started doing some 3D brain scan experiments with the dolphins and found, again, very different results than he did from, from the primates. So uh, for example, the dolphins with the pleasure trigger would push the trigger and they'd kind of have their their orgasms they'd do that for maybe you know 10 minutes an hour and then they'd go off and hunt again or they'd push the trigger for you know a while and then go play with their friends or eat or sleep and so it's almost much more like the human beings relationship with sex or with like our, our kinky sides of our own behavior as, as robert anton wilson i'm sure would have fun exploring but um the the difference there was they were not a slave to these base level drives right 
uh, they could, in fact, be presented with the greatest pleasure the dolphins can experience and still say, eh, but I still need to go eat, you know, or I still need to communicate in my, or uh, participate in my community. And same thing for the nausea button for dolphins, too. Uh, you know, mm. they, they did uh, have to hit this button every, you know, 10 minutes or so, or they'd start to feel nauseous. And uh, that said, they were able to still go out and hunt for longer periods of time. Right, so they just kind of push through that nausea and still go do the things they needed to do in life. So go like catch some fish, come back and then hit the nausea button, or like hit it and then actually get some some rest, kind of push through that nausea even in in their rest state, and then go hit it again when they when they needed to. And so he starts realizing that uh, you know by doing these these three D brain scans, that dolphins are actually much more in control of these base level instincts, these base level even emotions, you could call them, than monkeys and then primates seem to be. And that's when he started realizing that, hey, perhaps these are more like human beings, right? Like the next closest things that we can find to us aren't able to control these, these things that I'm putting into their brain with brain probes, basically. They're not able to control their base level emotions or desires or reactions to things like nausea. Whereas dolphins are definitely capable of that. Not only that, they're capable of taking advantage of it and using it as a new toy um, that they have, essentially, in the case of the, the orgasm button, but not something that dominates their life. Right. So very interesting. But again, all of this is research that's leading up to him trying to understand enough about the human brain and his own brain that he can now do these experiments in a much more rigorous way on himself, right? Eventually what happens with this is he... He, he has an interesting relationship with the government in general um, and a lot mm. of government research in that he, you know, he took a lot of government money. Um, he worked at the National Institutes of Health, which is where he developed the float tank. And then the military side of that just eventually he found so completely inextricable from the science side and the funding side and the laboratory side that uh, that was a large part of him giving up on any of his brain scanning research. And so... Eventually, he, he ended up discovering, he tells a great story about it in The Scientist, but he ends up discovering that this technology is being used for uh, military purposes, basically. And they're starting to put these remote-controlled 3D brain scanning injection uh, devices on top of donkeys, which I mentioned earlier, uh, to go deliver bomb payloads, basically. And they can send a little signal to the donkey to turn left or right and steer this donkey across you know, a giant desert, for example, and deliver some kind of payload of a bomb. And uh, I think it's around then, you know, I'm sure he had many, many different experiences with them, but he writes about essentially just realizing that anything that he discovers and any progress that he makes in, in any area almost is going to be turned to military applications. And especially with the idea of this like almost brain control or mind control, uh, I think that he just couldn't deal with that. And so he reluctantly and, and like very, very begrudgingly ends up giving up this lifelong quest to really scientifically study this mind-body duality in the same way. Yeah, it seems like he really had a, a strong sense of ethics in all this. I remember reading about some of his moral quandaries around dolphins and, and keeping them captive and things like that. Yeah, and he's a really, like, uh, I don't want to say problematic, but problematic probably is the right word. He's sort of a problematic figure in a lot of fields, right? Uh, if you ask a lot of, you know, dolphin researchers nowadays about John Lilly, they'll probably be very happy that he pioneered things, but also have, like, maybe not the best things to say even about his dolphin mm. ethics and how he treated them and ran his labs and things like that, right? I mean, just on the very, the most commonly told story, of course, is, yeah, injecting dolphins with LSD and mm. uh, running kind of these off-the-books experiments with them. Although he said that a dolphin never had a bad trip, so <laughs> um, whether or not that's uh, possible to ascertain, yeah, you can you can decide for yourself, but... Um, it's the same for so many of his things, right? You have these really interesting pieces of lab research coming out, but then he's trying to push the boundaries even further, right? You have psychedelic kind of explorers, and then he's trying to push these boundaries even further to the point where, you know, both the scientific community and even a lot of psychonauts are like, John Lilly, dude, you're going <laughs> too far out, right? Like, <laughs> like when people like Timothy Leary are telling you that you might be going too far out, like you're, you're somewhere, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. When Tim Leary tells you to slow down, you might have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Reconsider your your options. That's fabulous. So, so he begins to have sort of an ethical quandary with with is it military funding or just the the trajectory of his research going into the military and and switches directions or. Yeah, and I think really it's that he started to realize that these kind of high level government institutions and high level academic research is ultimately inextricable from military mm. uh, use and military funding if they see something they want, right? right. 
And so, yeah, I mean, no, that that was the beginning. So he does go off into a lot of dolphin research from there, separate from the brain scans, right? And really starts, that's where his idea of communication with dolphins and learning about dolphin language and really setting up his uh, dolphin laboratories comes into play, including this dolphin house, which uh, people may have heard of. This is one of the things he's most famous for, but setting up a full dolphin research laboratory that is set up more like a house where, for instance, the dining room is flooded. So when you're eating dinner, the dolphins can come in and uh, swim kind of, you know, next to your legs and eat dinner with you. And really setting up more of this physical and emotional interactive space with humans and dolphins, in addition to trying to learn their language and, and teaching them our language. So kind of uh, far out there stuff, but also, again, the beginnings of why we even know that dolphins are, are intelligent at all right now. And at the same time, he starts going into float tanks, and he develops his very first float tanks in 1954 um, at the National Institutes of Health. And the first float tank, the reason they're called float tanks, is it was literally just a giant water tank that he'd repurposed. And at the time, uh, you know, modern float tanks, you, you lay down in about 11 inches of water. They're fully saturated with Epsom salt. Um, so you float just like on the Dead Sea. But back then, you were fully submerged. You had like a, a breathing mask so you could breathe underwater. All the water is kept at skin temperature, which uh, is actually it's uh, skin receptor neutral. So it's more like 93 and a half degrees. And just to, to demonstrate what a rigorous scientist he was and kind of how ahead of his time. So we didn't actually even know what the external skin temperature was before John Lilly came along trying to build these float tanks. Like, he had to, through his experiments, figure out what the skin temperature was where we just completely lose track of our body, which ends up being, you know, a little lower than, than external skin temperature. It's still listed in a lot of places that the average skin temperature is 93.5. And just as a funny side note, I'm convinced that that's just John Lilly's skin temperature. Because running a float tank center, they, they, it changes all over the place. Like, everyone has, like, a slightly different external skin temperature. But that 93.5 number you'll see sometimes, I, like, that was the number John Lilly came up with. I think that's just John Lilly's specific external body temperature there yeah <laughs> um right so yeah he develops these float tanks and in the process also you know right you know before pretty much he's getting out of that phase of his life he decides to at the suggestion of a bunch of his friends end up doing lsd and so he does at least uh, according to him does his first lsd trip inside a float tank and has a very interesting ex i mean you, you can kind of imagine like he doesn't know what's going to happen in there, you know, or if he's going to freak out and drown himself or, or what's going to happen. In fact, even with the float tanks, which just kind of shows the extent of John Lilly's willingness to self-experiment, um, part of the reason he developed those was there was this argument going on at the time of how is our consciousness affected by sensory input, right? Like what happens if you just mm. took away all senses going into the human mind? Some people thought we'd just fall asleep. Some people thought that you'd uh, go insane, you know, if you were left too long in that state of just no, uh, no external input coming in. Um, some, I mean, this is like the fringe, but some people are like, maybe you die. <laughs> like, maybe you cut right. off external input and like, that's it. You know, your brain is like, well, nothing else coming in and just shuts off for good. Um, and so that was the state that John Lilly was going into these, uh, these float tanks in. Um, and instead, he comes out of the float tank, of course, the very first time. And he had a psychedelic experience even without psychedelics. Because it's John Lilly, and he was having these just anyway in his daily life, you know. So he goes in, he basically gets to talk to these entities, the same ones that he had previously visioned as, as angels. He, he gets out, and, and he's, yeah, just had this full kind of out-of-body experience. And then also his body feels great, because <laughs> it's been in zero gravity and actually just feels awesome and stretched out. And he's like, wow, what are these float tank things? So later now, he's doing the same thing, but on psychedelics has another conversation with these entities who come down to talk to him, who later on he kind of considered his, his guides. And he has, he has these recurring beings that come down to communicate with him during his life. And eventually, you know, comes to the conclusion much later that he is, in fact, one of these beings. And then later than that, determines that his body has been a host for several different beings who uh, have been touring through the galaxy and basically using his body as a vessel to experience what life as a human on the planet is right and so you go from again like uh, very quickly you go from this uh well quickly to us as we're we're telling the story i guess in his life it was you know decades in between each of these or a decade in between all of them but you go from this rigorous scientist who has some of the highest uh accolades and you know largest government grants all the way up to doing some self-experiments and and kind of getting into psychedelics and again removing all of the sensory input into the government and him realizing that he can't safely do anything that could be used as this sort of military project. And then from there, you really get into where he starts writing his own books and into where a lot of people who have read Lily read him, which is, you know, talking about Center of the Cyclone and his um, psychedelic experiences 
But kind of looking at it in that context, you can understand how being interested in, in our psychology, in what our brain is able to manifest in this brain-body duality, and then also realizing that anything you do in the academic discipline is going to be used against you or against other humans, now all of a sudden his path towards total self-experimentation and taking himself almost out of the Western scientific world and just going like uh, very, very intensely into experiments with LSD, with floating, with ketamine, with all these kind of more extreme lifestyle decisions is still pursuing the same path just in a way that, you know, in his mind, hopefully the government and other people who find out about it can't use against humanity, but ways that we can only use to benefit ourselves. Hmm. And, and maybe I'm overblowing this ethics issue, but it seems like if you're going to, to do some, some more radical experiments, that self-experimentation is, is one way to uh, stay within some ethical boundaries of not experimenting on others. Absolutely. And that was one of his, um, in medical school, you know, one of his heroes, um, that's pretty much their, their dictate, is uh, don't do unto other people what you would not do unto yourself, basically. And if you're trying something new, you need to be the first one to be the one who is experimented on, you know, the first human subject, basically. And so, yeah, John Lilly kept that throughout his entire life. Like, he would never do something on someone else that he would not do on himself first. And again, I think that's one of the reasons that he, like we mentioned earlier, regretted those dolphin autopsies and dolphin experiments early on so much was later on he viewed them as equivalent to humans. And in that sense, he'd kind of broken that ethical barrier of not wanting to do anything to other people, or in this case, you know, other intelligences here on the planet that you wouldn't do to yourself, which he absolutely did in that case. Mm. It seems it easy to criticize some of those early decisions, but at the same time, uh, it seems like we can look back and just think that we didn't know any better back then. And, and then he, he did come to realize that these dolphins are, are equivalent beings that we need to treat them more humanely and justly. Where are we at here? He's, he's experimenting on dolphins, he's floating, he's starting to experiment with psychedelics and float tanks at the same time, and, and uh, he has all kinds of interesting ideas about extraterrestrial communication and coincidence, and I don't know how that fits in the, the linear flow of things, but... <laughs> yeah, so the, those entities that we were talking about, you know, just to go to the, the extraterrestrial side of things, you know, he called that the kind of the agents of the Earth Coincidence Control Office. So agents of Echo, as he referred to them, which, by the way, Echo the Dolphin, if anyone remembers that from Sega Genesis, just tie in the fact that, yeah, they, there's aliens that come down that cause a giant time warp. It's called Echo. John Lilly discovered dolphin intelligence and also the yeah aliens that he communicated with. He called Echo. Anyway, Echo the Dolphin is totally a giant John Lilly reference for uh, yeah anyone out there uh -huh. who's uh, of the right age to have played that growing up. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, ECHO, the Earth Coincidence Control Office, is also uh, expanded upon by the Solar Coincidence Control Office, the Galactic Coincidence Control Office, the Universal Coincidence Control Office, um, ACHO <laughs> is the universal one, right? But So that was ultimately what he thought, and his, his kind of logic, uh, separate from communicating with these entities and, and, and so on during his life, was when... I mean, it's kind of going down that standard route of, hey, we exist, there's so many planets that can have habitable life, the universe is so old, we are developing so fast, there's likely other alien intelligence, it's likely that they are or have been more advanced than we are, uh, even to the point of, you know, psychic transmission, a lot of the stuff that um, Robert Anton Wilson talks about in, in his books as well, you know, is taken from a lot of the, the, you know, he's standing on the shoulder of giants, just as Lily is. But uh, his, his thought was a little different than other people. He said, well, what if you're one of these giant alien intelligences out there, alien civilizations, and you've reached this kind of point of transcendence, what do you do? You know, like, what do you spend your time doing? And his argument was, well, maybe you spend your time just kind of gently guiding things in the right direction. Hmm. You know, and that, so that's why he called it like coincidence control, not like the, the just like Earth control office. Right, or the Universal Coincidence Control Office instead of Universal Control. It's not like you're trying to run the universe in John Lilly's mind, but knowing what you do and having the power that you do, maybe you just try to make things a little bit easier on all the other entities out there, you know, kind of guide coincidence in the right way where certain ones of them or certain species can actually progress and not kill themselves out, right? So that's number one, is probably like that's what they're doing. And number two is they probably also just like to have a good time and we're tourists. And so he had this idea of these alien beings touring around and inhabiting different uh, species, you know, different individuals within that species to basically see what it's like 
to be them, you know, and, and grow up mm. and, and be a human on the planet Earth, you know, and then you get to do that for a while before you get sucked up to the giant cosmic consciousness and you're like, oh, that was a fun tour, you know, okay, let's go off to this totally different galaxy and check out what it's like to be this organism over here, you know, check out a different coincidence control office on the, the other side of the universe. And uh, yeah, I mean, he, he especially, you know, on psychedelics, but also off of them in the float tanks on ketamine, especially later in his life, uh, you know, mm. said that he documented hundreds of different dimensions or planets that he would travel to, uh, could actually like consciously go between them to revisit different places. And it just talked to so many different entities in his, his explorations that, yeah, we did almost put some of my shaman friends to shame here in Portland, you know, um, truly, uh, you know, as he was known later in life, like a, a great explorer. And then he'd come back and write scientifically about it and actually try to document his experiences. So as opposed to so many people, he also never let, like got rid of this kind of rigorous scientific side of his brain as well, despite constantly expanding his beliefs, um, beliefs unlimited, as he would say. Right. And, and through all that, he seemed to develop I'm not sure if it was his own or derivative of another system, but kind of a model of consciousness. Yeah, for sure. And, and you'll see this, yeah, scattered all over the place. It, ultimately, I think he ends up using a lot of the uh, Gurdjieff scale kind of language. So talking about, uh, you know, the plus and minus states, plus, uh, we're really at the end, you know, plus one, which he called being uh, at the God level, essentially, which you can't remember and uh, you can't talk about. And really says later, you can't really talk about any of these states, but, you know, up to plus 48, mm. um, which is kind of our, our average waking around or walking around state, um, and then kind of having, so you have plus 24, which is, as he says, maybe more of the state for uh, when you're engaged in your work, you know, and time just starts flying by and you're like, oh, I've been writing this, uh, this document for the last two hours, but it feels like 15 minutes, you know, that's like mm. the plus 24 state. Um, down to plus oh, 12, man. which is maybe more a little like stoned and um, starting to get out there. Uh, again, yeah, plus six plus three, et cetera. 20, 24 sounds like a, what we might call a flow state these days. Yep, exactly. And I was actually just rereading, um, or reading, uh, I'd only read excerpts actually, so Cosmic Trigger for the first time leading up to this interview. But yeah, Robert Anton Wilson, same thing, you know, takes a lot from the, the Gurdjieff scale. There's other people who basically document the same thing. There's actually a, a diagram in this, uh, The Scientist, where he lays out a couple different scales tracking consciousness, mm. but lays out exactly which the different ones mean corresponding to each other. So kind of the Gurdjieff scale, according to these other couple scales of consciousness exploration, but very much, you know, that same idea, and, and at least this stuff has really only been more and more backed up by science, um, as I, I'm sure you know, kind of being in the psychological space. But this, this idea that we do actually have more control over our psychological states than we think, and also that we're able to travel between them, and that perhaps us at the, you know, negative 12 state, where now we're uh, actually like not, we're kind of in our own little like head trip, right, is very different mm. than us at plus 24, which is in turn different than, than us at plus 48, when we're actually walking around just talking to people which is different than us at like negative six when we're actually in the midst of, you know, like a full on depressive episode or a full on like anxiety attack or something like that. Right. And perhaps we need to even not think about these forms of ourself as the same thing, but like as the, you know, Lily in plus 12 or as the, yeah, Graham in negative 48 as opposed to Graham in positive 48, right. Is, is not necessarily that, that same person. So it is one of the things that I really think that Robert Anton Wilson I was going to say took away from Lily, but I'd say more like latched onto with him because he, you know, the, the kind of eternal skeptic believer, right, is uh, Robert Anton Wilson. And Lily is the exact same thing. You know, he talks mm. so much about having to, um, you know, and he did everything from go down to um, South America and work really intently with these kind of gurus down there who, yeah, Robert Anton, on Anton Wilson talks about as well, to completely ditching them and saying they're full of shit. You know, um, <laughs> he'd start off every lecture by saying, uh, you know, everything that I say is bullshit, right? Like, don't listen nice. to me, essentially, at least on the level where you're listening to my words. So he has this great skepticism, but also he, he thinks that the only way to find out more about life is to launch into whatever you're studying in each experience as though you had no preconceptions, like as though you believed in it fully and experience it under that circumstance and then come out the other side and then you can use your rational mind to look back on that experience and judge for yourself what happened, you know? Oh, that's great. So yeah, it's... basically, like, go go full hold, you know, go into the, the, the chapel perilous. Like, go go in there. Like, see what it's like and just, like, live inside the, that existence and then come out the other side and then say, hey, what did I just do? <laughs> like, it was, was I acting totally crazy back then? And, so, and yeah, that comes up so often in Lily's writings, and I really think that that 
probably more than anything, and there's a lot to appreciate in him, is what Robert Anton Wilson and he really like align with and why there's so much of Lily in, in Wilson's work. That, that's fascinating. What, what comes up for me is that if you have this sort of skeptic mindset that it can create some distance between what you're trying to experience or the experience you're having. And, but if you just allow yourself to really dive right into the mindset and, and experience it to the fullest and then apply the skeptic hat later on, that you get more of a genuine experience and you can tease it apart after the fact. Absolutely. And again, I think it's one of those things that, you know, obviously things like psychedelics help open up, um, even things like just meditation, reflection, journaling, you know, on the, the very basic level. Um, but this realization that you, you from the past or you in a certain state is not always you, right? And I think a lot of people are really afraid to, to take that leap or, you know, some people call it the, you know, um, ego destruction of being able to do that. But yeah, that idea of you, you don't need to always be the skeptical version of yourself. And there is a time and a place for that. Uh, but if especially you're trying to explore these fringe ideas and, and things that have never been explored before, you know, a lot of the reason we know so much about ketamine is because of John Lilly. Um, he was sort of the first to really explore it in a psychonautical sense. And were it not for him, it might have been, you know, another decade or, or longer before we really realized some of the, the impacts of deep ketamine use. But yeah, you know, he was willing to go down that rabbit hole and to experiment on himself. And to do that, I think that necessarily you need to say, hey, I'm not a ketamine like drug addict, but for the moment, I'm going to basically be behaving as though I was. And being able to draw that separation is both difficult, right? The Chapel Perilous is essentially a seduction, even in the, the original Arthurian story. And and yeah, so it's it's the ability to be able to leave the chapel eventually uh, is one of those things that I think does take discipline and everyone who's gone into it eventually finds themselves uh, stuck more or less and either finds their way out or doesn't or just all of a sudden they're they're on the outside in the forest again they're like what just happened right <laughs> right right and it just as i think about that i'm just like tense like if i'm going to go into chapel perilous i might want to have that skeptic's armor on to protect myself and to be just to shed all that and like i'm going to go straight into the belly of the beast and see what happens that's um that's pretty intense to me <laughs> for sure i mean that's that's all of these guys, right? Like the the one the 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 early psychonauts who a didn't even know what was really going on, right? Like they they don't have the all of the trip reports and all of the experiences that we have now to to work through and their own writings, but going yeah, like you said, into the belly of the beast without knowing what's you know what you're going to come out as, what's going to happen in there is is completely if not terrifying at least like anxiety inducing. I suppose. Yep. Yeah, pushing past that is just like every great explorer who's going to sail across the ocean to some new shore that no one presumably is, has ever been to before, right? And what are you going to find? What's right. Going to I'm going to try LSD and I'm going to do it in a float tank for my first time. Like, right. <laughs> <laughs> buckle up, buttercup. Uh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oof. So, okay. So what did he do much in terms of like say ketamine and the ketamine experiences and correlating that with his states of consciousness models or, or was it more fluid yeah than absolutely that? yeah and um and pretty much you know at different stages in lily's life and this never stops too not only in his published work but um having gone down to his stanford archives and look at some of his journals and things like that you know he's always trying to to model things Mm -hmm. You know, and, and as uh, he and Wilson would definitely say, you know, the, the map is not the geography, right? But that said, he was always trying to make maps and always trying to relate this back to both different models that he'd read. I mean, by the, the you know, I wouldn't even say the end of his life, but getting, getting up in years, you know, by his, his 50s, 60s, um, I guess he, like his 50s, he was really an expert in probably almost anything that you could talk to someone about for Eastern religion, you know, for mm. science. He was an electrical engineer as well, you know, did a bunch of early circuitry work. So he could really like hold his own on conversations with everything from, uh, you know, current electrical engineers down to Alan Watts talking about, you know, the history of uh, Buddhism and, and different forms of tantric awakening and things like that. So yeah, a, a huge breadth of, of interest. And again, all of this just, he'd lay, he'd lay graph over graph, essentially, and be like, hey, I think these states from this religion correspond to what I'm experiencing on ketamine at this state, correspond to, um, but all of them, which I love, which doesn't always happen in those and, and is omnipresent in Lily's work, is every single one of those charts ends with unknown. <laughs> like you reach, a, you reach a high enough level of consciousness or you push past those previous boundaries that we had, and it, it would always end in, and after this, we don't know. 
no one knows. We just don't know. <laughs> right? And I love that he went there. It's not like you can chart everything. He just says, and here is where we run up against the unknowable, which I really appreciate about his cartography of the mind, so to say. Yeah, that seems super important to me, too, to just hold that there's always a mystery. And the more we learn, not just the more you know, the more you know you don't know, but that there's always a mystery that you're bumping up against that may or may not ever be understood. That's fantastic. Tell me about metaprogramming. I'm curious about his attitude towards brain change and, and change and transformation in general. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's very similar to, um, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy today, I would say, and kind of one of the not bases for it, because I, I, I'm not sure how much the, the, the people developing that actually pulled from Lily. But certainly the, that same train of thought, right? Again, we, we are not our beliefs. Um, anything that we do believe can be transcended. Beliefs are these things which can be transcended. Even this belief that beliefs can be transcended is something else to be examined, right? Like that's, that's very, very Lillian. So his idea of programming was that, uh, yeah, and again, like in the very modern sense, he was actually so, he's such a broadly influenced and broadly influential person. I keep finding him in all of these different places. So I just learned that, uh, mm. so I'm also really into cybernetics and system science. This is kind of a, a little tangent, but related to the programming aspect. So Ross Ashby was a really interesting, one of the early cyberneticists and system scientists. And he was kind of the mathematician among the, the cyberneticists, much like John Lilly was the, the scientist among the psychonauts, right? And uh, Ross Ashby is, is kind of famous for publishing what's considered to be kind of the first major work comparing our brain to computers and saying like, hey, you know, just like we're finding out these computers can be programmed and like, you know, we're, we're doing these things with circuits. Maybe we can think about the brain a little bit like these computers and that we're programming that, right? And so John Lilly was, was kind of the second, you know, now we think of programming ourselves or like our, our brains as a computer and computers are everywhere. So it's easy to do. But John Lilly back in the day was one of the early scientists who was actually working with um, you know, early computers and the actual, you know, cathodes and, and uh, the, the very early machines. And so for him, I think, and, and Ross Ashby, it was more natural to make this comparison. But just imagine being back when programming and metaprogramming was written, and you didn't really, the mass populace, like if you're reading that, you don't really know what the idea of like programming a computer is, like it's in the common mm. vernacular now, right? So he's kind of introducing this idea of, hey, our computer is being programmed, right? It's programmed uh, by our parents, it's programmed by our church, it's programmed by our school, by our friends, by these experiences that we have. And so those are all kind of these, like, so what is doing the programming then is the next question, right? Like, what, what do all these things have in common? And you can say, well, if we're the thing being programmed, then they are programmers, right? That are, that are doing the programming. And so, like, how do we then take control over what's being programmed into us, um, which he would call metaprogramming. And so it's this idea that we get to decide how we want to be programmed or even how we're programming ourselves, right? Yeah. And, and rather than just being this entity that is being programmed, or you know, even if we're, we're kind of programming ourselves, we might not think about how. And so for example, you know, if you aren't used to exercising on a regular basis, the instinct to get up and like go for a morning half an hour jog is probably very, very weak in you. <laughs> and if you're used to having coffee, yeah. you might do that instead, right? But if you want to be the kind of person who would go on a jog, just like, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy has a bunch of tools for that, John Lilly would say, well, then you need to figure out how to program yourself to be the kind of person who wants to go on a jog. How are, how are you going to make sure that when you wake up in the morning, you're going to do this? And how are you going to switch your own thought process around to make this part of who you are and your new reality? Basically, how do you take control of your own program away from the random programmers that exist around you and put it back into your own hands? And he, and he used it mostly for self-metaprogramming. You know, you can have this idea of metaprogramming in the sense of creating a curriculum almost for other people or metaprogramming other people's programs. But that was very much like, you pretty much never hear John Lilly talking about it like that, you know, uh, again, related to the kind of self-ethics. But he was much more interested in this idea of using metaprogramming or that idea of, of just recognizing that your brain is a thing that is, you know, has pattern-seeking behavior and and, uh, and kind of does things on, again, um, going mm. back to my, my own interest in the world too, like you get stuck in ruts if you're not careful and you do the same thing yesterday that you're going to do today. And for him, metaprogramming was kind of the language that he used to, again, kind of take control and get you out of those ruts. Got you. I like that phrase, pattern-seeking behavior. I appreciate that distinction. I, I was not aware of that, but what I'm getting is that 
programming itself is sort of what we get as we grow up and, and develop where we're kind of from the external world programs us. And then if we reach a point where we take sovereign self-responsibility of our own situation and begin to do self-programming, we're undoing maybe the old programming and that would be meta-programming. Yeah. And, you know, we, we program ourselves too all the time, right? Like through the things that we say, through our own thought processes, through our, again, habitual actions. So we're always programming ourselves too. Um, he would say it's just, yeah, you need that conscious level to be able to meta program yourself. And so the consciousness is what, what brings you, like self consciousness brings you to a more of a meta programming state versus just a, a non conscious programmed state. Is that? I would say so, yeah. You know, and, and he'd use other tools too. Like the, uh, I mean, this is a, another funny story about programming and metaprogramming. So first of all, anyone out there listening to this, if you're like, I'm going to go pick up a book of programming and metaprogramming in the human biocomputer and see what he has to say, just skip the introduction and go straight to the next thing. The preface will even tell you to skip the introduction, which is really mm -hmm. funny. He says in there that, you know, he's be, he, there's a lot of chapters on using LSD to clear your mind of, of its kind of preconceived habits and to reprogram yourself. And, and a lot of them, even he's talking about LSD, these kind of universal experiences, um, but it reads more like a trip report. It's like, you know, he didn't know that these were just, that this is John Lilly on, on acid, basically having these experiences. He's like, everyone will do this thing. Like everyone will see their belly button as a weird little mouth in the middle of their stomach, <laughs> you know, and like their nipples as eyes. It's like, um, maybe that's just, that's just your little trip that you're on, right? But so he would say, you know, uh, uh, just all of that is to say, I think it's it's less consciousness. You know, he had this, I, maybe it is conscious. I don't know. It's, it's so hard to, as he would say, language is a poor tool to use for communication. It's a great tool to use <laughs> for like explaining mathematics and saying, you know, like two plus two equals four and trying to explain that concept, but trying to explain the limits of the mind and what it can do. Mm. It's, a, it's a very poor tool to be able to do that, which is why he said everything that I say is bullshit because it has to go through this filter of, of language. So... Uh, perhaps there's just not the right words to to kind of explain it. Consciousness might be the closest we can get. Self awareness. There's there's something maybe about like intention in there mm -hmm. too. Like I think you could realize that you're being programmed and be conscious of it and still not take any path towards trying to meta program yourself <laughs> in that sense. So yeah, maybe there's there's something of intention in there too. Anyway, now we're just getting the vagaries of yeah some of his more heady heady belief systems, which are hard to untangle. When you bring up intention. When I look at some of his work, I just appreciate his his dedication, his commitment to all this. Like a lot of the work he does in self experimentation seems to require a, a great deal of commitment to to follow through with. That just comes up for me when I when I look at his work. So absolutely, yeah. I mean, to his own detriment in a lot of cases, right? And he tells. I mean, he talks fully uh, about at least some of those stories. I can only imagine the stories that he doesn't tell. Right, but about uh, getting really high on ketamine, just deciding he needs to like ride his bike down from his home that's up on this you know really steep mountain hill all the way down to take care of something, and just you know gets like part way down and eats it and like punctures along with his rib and has like a very near death experience. Another time when he's playing around on ketamine, he's in a hot tub, and his wife Tony just has this sense that she needs to go check on him, and walks outside the hot tub and he's passed out on ketamine face down in the water has to get, yeah, you know, taken out to a hospital another time where he's, uh, you know, taking a bunch of, I think he was on ketamine for this one as well, but is convinced that aliens are actually, you know, communicating with him and are going to pose an immediate safety threat to the United States and he needs to talk to the president and uh, no one will listen to him and gets on a plane and starts like actually traveling out to Washington, D.C. to like tell the president about what's going on and eventually through there like gets intercepted by some friends and taken to like a mental hospital for a time. Um, so no, he was he was committed to going kind of as deep down his own limits of both psyche and, and physicality as he could. And uh, I think especially later in life, you know, he he said about that, that he, he one of his fam famous quotes, of course, is in the province of the mind, there are no limits. Uh, but then he had an addendum later in life, which was, uh, but in the province of the physical body, there are definitely limits and you shouldn't try to transcend them. <laughs> right? Ah. Like you maybe shouldn't try to ride a bicycle uh, downhill when you're completely blasted on ketamine. Yeah. <laughs> Were there limits to who we can be and become through programming and metaprogramming? And then, of course, it's just the limit is a belief and the beliefs are to be transcended. But, but at some point, it seems like we still are limited, but I don't want to put a limit on myself. By saying that. Yeah, yeah. So you have to be careful with things like that. Once you say that we're, you know, it seems like we'd be limited. You're kind of metaprogramming yourself to say maybe there are limits. Um, but uh, no, you know, I think he would say ultimately that, that there is this differentiation between 
the physical. I mean, it's kind of interesting now that I'm thinking about it. I don't think I'd ever thought about it like this, but so much of his early life is like, is there a difference between the mental and the physical? And later in life, he said, hey, there, there really is. You know, in, in the province mm -hmm. of the mental, there are no limits. But he also said there at least, you know, uh, whether it's an illusion or not, like I have this physical body that I'm stuck with and I need to take better care of it than, than I have been at, at different points in my life, right? Um, so I would say that, you know, I think that he really does does think that our beliefs shouldn't have limits and we can we can transcend whatever those limits are, but that there is, you know, at least from our perception, this physical reality that we do need to contend with. And there are certainly limits within that and the the overlap between the two, right? Where our beliefs lead us right. within the physical realm can cause serious physical problems, even though the beliefs themselves are not problematic and, uh, you know, perhaps can be completely limitless. Mm. Yeah, where does where does the physical limit the mental, or you know, what are the constraints that we, by sheer nature of our physical existence, are limited? We could probably go down that rabbit hole for sure. A while. Well, yeah, if if nothing else, certainly in like things like overdosing, right? Even if you'd want to go further down the the ketamine uh, hole than than he ever explored, like there is a limit to the human body, and at some point you just can't go any further without, you know, at least ending this uh, this manifestation of our, our physical body here. So if we were to look at John Lilly today, what would be, do you think some of the takeaways for 2021 or 2022? Sure. Yeah. 2022. Here we are. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, I was actually kind of thinking about this leading into it. And I, I realized that I think every single interview that I've listened to where someone's talking about, you know, an author or a, a figure that they're into, um, they always say, man, you know, there's so much to take away from this person for our modern era. And so I'm no different, right? I'm like, yeah, man, there's so much to take away from John Lilly for yeah. the times that we happen to find ourselves in. But maybe that's just what happens when you, uh, you know, love uh, love someone enough <laughs> and love their, their kind of thoughts and writing. But, there's a lot uh, to love. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. So, you know, if nothing else, I, I think that thinking of him as this explorer and the things that we want to explore while we have time on this planet is worth mm. considering, right? Um, and I also love his, his kind of neutrality in doing that, right? So he'd say, hey, let me launch into this full bore and then come out the other side and try to report on it as, as scientifically as I can, kind of like we talked about before, like just go, go whole hog and then look at it skeptically afterwards when you're not in the midst of something. By the end of his life, to be honest, he was very distant from a lot of the people around him and a lot of conversations that they wanted to have. So, uh, like, I feel like although he has a lot of lessons, he also just kind of realized that the world had not taken those lessons by the time that he passed away. You know, he's kind of famous for people go to his house and try to have a conversation. I was talking to one person in the float world who was chatting with him. And he's like, uh, he'd just been on stage and John Lilly hadn't really said much and didn't really, like, answer many questions or answered them very tersely, you know. And afterwards, uh, this this figure in the float world is talking to him and says, "Hey, you know why uh, why were you so terse on stage, or why didn't you share some of your your big wisdom?" You know, and John Lilly says, like, kind of thinks about it afterwards and says, "Because the questions they were asking, like yours now, don't need much to say about them, mm. right? Like you you don't need to comment much on them. In other words, like they're 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 not the most interesting questions to have like something to say about. And I think that's kind of how he felt about anything. Like a, a lot of things that were going on around him at that time was that people basically were really rooted in their ways. People did take on these these very fixed personas. You know, I mean, think about it now. Just the amount of times we're presented with information that's contrary to what we personally believe, and refuse to act as though we then believe it. Robert Anton Wilson talks about that. Uh, so many of my, my favorite, even modern writers, really will make it a habit of trying to read something that they don't like. You know, whether that's they're like a sci-fi writer and they're like, I'm going to read like a romance novel at least once a year. Like just a schlocky, stupid romance novel <laughs> that I think that I don't appreciate and try to appreciate it. Right. Or mm. I'm going to read something from the complete other political side of the spectrum that I don't agree with and pretend for the time that I'm reading it that I agree with it you know, that my beliefs aren't fixed. I mean, you see, you know, a lot of dialogue kind of going on around that. Like, hey, don't get so caught up in, in your echo chamber, right? Which the modern world really is, is keen on presenting us with. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I think in John Lilly's terms, he'd say like, hey, you know, go, go into and explore these other sets of beliefs. Like, don't be so tied into what you think you think. You know, spend more time, mm -hmm. as he would say, um, thinking about thinking and considering consideration. 
right? And what are you spending your time with? And how can you broaden your views rather than shrink them down into this narrow container that you then are able to label as yourself or your beliefs? Like, aren't you and what you think bigger than that, surely? So, you know, as far as like general lessons that I certainly try to inhabit on a daily basis, whether or not I succeed, I think that's, uh, that's one of the big ones to take away. And, and as we go back to these questions he got bored with later in life, I, almost the message I get is, is, don't ask me these questions. Go explore for yourself. Go, go develop your own experience and your own ideas around that. And, right, totally. Because they're asking him things like, wow, what was it like to, you know, take so much LSD and like go off and do these things and do these shamanistic experiences? And it's kind of like, hey... Yeah, you know, well, I wrote about it, A, <laughs> and kind of expressed everything I could there. And, and like you said, yeah, maybe you should be exploring the experience of it rather than exploring the mediation of that experience through my own language. Yeah. Mm, right, right. Go from talking about to experiencing. Talk about float tanks. That seems like one area where we could take Lily's work and, you know, I could run out. I'm, I'm fortunate to be near Boulder, Colorado, so there's always... Uh, a variety of the alternative available to me and there's a couple of float centers near me but uh maybe not everybody has that although it seems like it's gaining in popularity but what would you say to somebody that's uh interested in exploring flotation definitely do it if you're watching uh or listening i guess not watching listening to this podcast then you're certainly a fan of robert anton wilson so I ended up picking up all three of the, the Cosmic Trigger books because I didn't realize the other two were written so so far in advance until I, I got them and did a little research. But uh, I think at Cosmic Trigger 3, he actually starts off describing his his birth, right? And he describes it like emerging from a lily tank, <laughs> mm. <laughs> which is pretty amazing. So, you know, even even late in his life when he thinks back on, uh, you know, his his own origins and thinks, you know, he's comparing that to float tanks. So they're certainly very womb-like. There is this return to almost this kind of blissful, non-thinking state. But yeah, so, you know, John Lilly's experience with float tanks, the early ones, like I said, you know, you had face masks, you had an oxygen tube going in, uh, you had this, this safety observer who was making sure that oxygen is flowing and you don't die in there. You know, that's all, all totally a thing of the past, right? So now, um, over the years, it kind of developed to where uh, John Lilly actually developed the, the kind of evolution of this, of going from that to laying down in freshwater and doing what he called dolphin breathing. So he'd bend his knees and he'd hold his breath and then breathe out and go, and then breathe in again really fast, right? So that's how dolphins kind of blow through their blowhole. They like breathe out and then breathe in really fast. And then, so there's a lot of, they're spending most of their time holding their breath, right? And when you do that, even in fresh water, then the upper part of your torso can kind of stay on the water. So now he has a way to, uh, uh. with this breathing technique, actually be able to stay on top of the water without sinking and still get that same kind of weightless feeling to, then he started piping up water from the ocean into the tank to get a little more buoyancy in it. To Glenn Perry, who's one of the inventors of the, the first commercial float tank, along with John Lilly, was like, hey, why don't we pipe, or why don't we, we just saturate this with sodium chloride, with table salt, basically. And that turned into, uh, wow, that was really great, and we floated no problem, but it really stings. <laughs> like, if you have mm. any cut with sodium chloride, it's awful. And so then John Lilly said, well, what about magnesium sulfate? And so then we end up with this now self-contained, very shallow pool of saturated magnesium sulfate solution that you can float in. Yeah, for modern float tank centers, uh, you know, the rooms themselves are really soundproof. They have their own shower on the inside almost always. Uh, when you turn off the light on the inside of the float tank, there's no light. Um, they're often about the size of a queen-size bed. So, you know, maybe five feet wide, eight feet long. So pretty big. All the water's kept at skin temperature, like we mentioned, around 93 and a half degrees. So when you get in there, there's uh, no sight, no sense of touch no sound, and almost no gravity on your body. So kind of the closest thing to being in outer space that you can, that you can mm. have. And I think what, you know, Lily and so many people after him have loved is that uh, it's kind of like training wheels for meditation, you know, and it actually naturally, now we finally have uh, been able to show just within the last decade that our brain is actually going into very similar waves that you go into in meditation. So we kind of go into this extended theta state, which is sort of halfway between waking and sleeping in a float tank. And uh, it just sort of keeps us there. Like the theta state we get for maybe five minutes before we fall asleep every night, you know? Um, it's kind of that, like, if you suddenly get waking up, wake, woken up when you're falling asleep, you're like, oh, wait, was I asleep or, or was I not asleep? Um, and the float tank just kind of keeps us there. So it is this great place for being able to go not only eliminate distractions, but even kind of like tone down your own mental waves, like in a way, eliminate the distraction of your own thought. 
uh, which also makes it a perfect venue for metaprogramming and considering your own beliefs. Um, even for something as, as kind of hardcore as, as PTSD, right, where your own thoughts are constantly intruding on you and to this very emotionally heightened state. In the float tanks, because your body is so comfortable and kind of every cue that's being sent says you're comfortable. And I should say when I say because, this is kind of the modern theory, we don't really know. We don't have the kind of money that's been thrown into float research to understand why it helps people with PTSD. But this is a lot of the, the current theories as to why it helps is your body's in such a, a reduced state of, of anxiety and um, excitation. And so even when, and people often report going through these kind of traumatic experiences, you know, reliving them like they would with PTSD in a float tank, but their brain is not sending that same emergency signal. And so they're kind of able to look at that in a much more dispassionate way and kind of examine it more, more objectively almost and say like, hey, well, maybe there's, there's less to be scared of here than I thought, right? So it's almost like desensitization um, training that you'd use for other phobias. Um, or that often they do with, with PTSD. But the float tank seems to allow this space for people to engage in that behavior both um, unattended and very naturally, you know, without even a kind of a guide to take them through it or a counselor, which is, which is interesting. So, uh, you know, from the standpoint of, again, tying into to Lily and, and Wilson, I think uh, one of the big benefits of the float tank is providing this space where you can re-examine your beliefs or where you can go deep down the rabbit holes of some of your weirder beliefs and see where they lead without the fear that someone's going to be criticizing you without really anything going on around you except for that experience of your own thought process. And, and do you just, how do you do that? How do you explore your own beliefs? I'm, I'm curious about that. Uh, sure. Well, I mean, it, it depends. Like, so we could just take something like incredibly simple, right, um, of, of a belief you want to explore. Like, uh, you know, often the, the beliefs you want to explore, I would say, are the negative ones rather than the, the positive ones, perhaps, to start. So something like, uh, you know, uh, I'm, uh, like, I, I feel like I've been a bad friend to these mm -hmm. people, or, like, I feel like I, I have not been the best, you know, father, or I feel like I'm just, like, lazy all the time and I'm not contributing as much as I should, right? This, this kind of inner monologue that goes on. So in a float tank or on psychedelics or, you know, through journaling, I mean, there's plenty of ways that, um, you know, don't involve anything outside of ourselves except us taking the time to do it. Uh, these other things we could call just very useful tools in that process. But actually taking that and, you know, picking it up and turning it around and saying, well, let's assume the opposite. Like, what if I, what if I go and assume that I am a good father or I am a good friend or I'm not lazy, I'm very productive. And maybe I'm just like taking this break so that I can be more productive later. Or maybe like I need to take time to do the things that I care about so that I can come back from them and be a good friend. And being a good friend doesn't necessarily tie into these metrics that I've been assuming before. Or, you know, anything that you believe, you can kind of start tearing down to it's why do I believe this and what goes into it. And then from there, you can say, well, not only like I, I know how to reshape this, but like, let's try on a different suit. You know, like, let's go to the clothing store and see like how this suit fits. Like, what does this belief um, go on like? Oh, does this belief go well with this other belief? You know, does the tie match the jacket, so to say? Mm. Um, and you don't need to worry about people judging you for that in the float tank. And not only that, but your brain waves are kind of shifting down to this very open state. Um, your ability to kind of let go of your own definition of yourself and of these things that you thought defined you kind of goes away a little bit or is le at least softened, right? Mm. Um, um, and again, yeah, same with things like psychedelics, same even just with going on silent retreats or like the, the kind of linguistic uh, experiment of, uh, you know, not trying not to use the word I, uh, you know, or, 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 you know, this more like neuro-linguistic programming, same effect, right? Like how do we soften the edges of our beliefs such that we can at least try on different ones and see, you know, maybe we come out the other side and say, I don't want to change that belief. Like I came out, there are all these other things I could believe. I actually like this one and I feel like it's a good way to think about myself and productive. Or you might try on all these other beliefs, like going to a clothing store and being like, you know what? I'm going to stop dressing in sweatpants all day long. I actually am going to wear like a button up shirt occasionally, or maybe like I'm a button up shirt guy now. And that's just what I do all day, every day. Right. But unless you're willing to go experiment around with, with that, you know, to play around with the, the trappings of your mind, then uh, it's very hard to ever switch your outfit, and if you're not careful, then yeah, you're just walking around in your your old sweatpants all day that you've pretty much had since high school, gotcha. metaphorically. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it sounds like the float tank creates an opening to where you're maybe less attached to your your current beliefs, and then you can try on some new ones and see how they fit. And um, 
explore that space and then decide later if you want to keep it or not. Is that for sure? And again, very similar to um, and I, I know that you've been yeah involved in um, psychology and, and therapy for a while, too. So, yeah, again, I, I keep coming back to like cognitive behavioral therapy, not just because it's kind of been shown to be the, the most effective, if not one of the most effective uh, yeah, therapies out there for actually, you know, aiding in, in people's problems they're trying to overcome, but also because there's so much in common with both Lily's philosophy, with the things that Wilson loved about Lily's philosophy, and with this idea of doing those same types of practices, those same um, uh, things on yourself, either with a float tank or outside of a float tank, right? So yeah, very, very, very similar. And I think one of the first beliefs that you need to adopt, just like Lily says, is that, uh, you know, your beliefs can be changed. Um, you are not the things you, you currently think. You're like the, the amalgam of that, or you're just the present iteration of that. And even that belief, as he would say, is another belief to, to be transcended. But if you never start that cycle and you just say, I am my thoughts and I have always been and will always be how I feel and what I'm thinking right now, then that's a very confining space to be in. So I think, yeah, step number one is to, to break out of that one regardless I mean, I should say, too, as we talk about float tanks, like this, this, uh, this is because we're on a Robert Anton Wilson podcast. A lot of people go into float just because they have like hip pain or like they've had, uh, you know, back surgery a couple years ago and they find floating really helps with the physicality. Um, some people go in and they're not doing work, but they do like actually have full on visions and hallucinations in there. Right. And they think that that's like really amazing and they're not like doing as much kind of psychological work, but they are kind of going on this little light show tour and, and come out and their body also feels really good. So there's, you know, many, many different reasons people go into float, not just this idea of uh, kind of the hardcore reprogramming work that Lily would probably encourage. Yeah, I've never used a float tank to reprogram per se, but I find that that after five or 10 minutes, I just slip into like a dream space and I just. I don't really do much there, but I, you know, all of a sudden I'll wake up when it's time to, to snap back to reality. And I'm like, I was just dreaming for 50 minutes or one of the centers I went at was sort of primitive and they would just knock on the door, uh, when sure. it was time, when it was, you know, it was time for you to get out. And, uh, for somehow I would always pull out of this dream space, like three or five minutes before the knock and I would just be ready for it. And then all of a sudden, Oh, there's the knock. And I always fascinated me how somehow my body or my mind seemed to know it was it was time or i wonder what would you say to somebody that's anxious about getting into a float tank this confined oh, well, space yeah yeah i mean for don't be i guess would be the first <laughs> thing i'd say like uh, that's that's maybe just another belief to be transcended you know um but uh, yeah, they, like so, we've had the most claustrophobic people come into our float center to float and float in our most confined float tank, and have not had a single problem with that. Mm. You know, and I would say that idea of claustrophobia is one of the the biggest fears about it. But claustrophobia ends up being so much more about being uh, like a lack of control, being out of mm. control of your environment, which is often associated with a uh, kind of closed in space. Um, so the float tanks, you know, uh, any, especially for people who do, um, have claustrophobia or have experienced that in other parts of their life, uh, you know, you, the, the doors don't latch much less lock or anything. You can leave the light on the whole time. Um, you know, I usually recommend people just like leave the door to the tank open, go in, leave the light on and just sit in the water. Right. And now you're sitting in like 11 inches of water with the lights on. And it's pretty much just like sitting in a shallow bathtub. And you just do that until it feels unthreatening. It's like at some point, just lay back in the water and you're like, oh, this is comfortable. Still have the lights on, still have the door open. And often within like 15 to 20 minutes, people feel comfortable enough in that space. That they're just like, okay, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll shut the door or turn off the light. And some people don't get to that point until their third float, their fourth float, you know, depending on um, kind of their, their fears going into it. But I have never met anyone except for people who actually have like hydrophobia, who don't like the feeling of getting wet at all mm. like hate the feeling of water on their skin i'm like yeah maybe you should find another practice because this is all about being like in salt water right other than that though uh, you really are, are almost guaranteed to not have a, a problem with floating or, or at least the fears that you have are um yeah kind of uh non-justified in that sense the the other thing i'd say is it it really is unlike anything else you know like you get in there your spine decompresses like the first thing that happens to me is it sounds like gunshots going off Right, because I get in there and my spine just like cracks and, and you know, there's no other sound going on. So it's just like pop, 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 pop. And I'm like, oh man, I guess I needed that, you know. I usually kind of like splash around like a, like a mermaid or something for the first 15 minutes and do a lot of like stretching. And then at some point I just start sitting still and relaxing. 
And my, my favorite part, though, you know, I, we do hour and a half long sessions at our center here, um, two and a half hour late night sessions. And uh, some people just do hour long sessions. You know, that's that's great, too. Uh, but you get this post-float afterglow that often lasts for two to three days afterwards where, um, and this has also been studied, you know, like your um, anxiety levels decrease, uh, your cortisol production goes down, uh, you're basically, again, you're kind of in this uh, more relaxed, blissed out state, not just in body because you basically just got a massage without getting touched, but also just in your neurochemistry where you've, for a little bit, and this is this is so crazy, but for a little bit, you you've not been exposed to the stresses of the outside world, and just that hour and a half is enough to balance you out and reduce your anxiety and stress and increase your mood and and sense of well-being for days afterwards, you know, even up to like a week in some cases, which to me speaks just so much to how insane our world is right now. Like the human body, right? Because float tanks aren't anything is something else that's worth coming back to, right? Which is another thing that I think John Lilly would, would agree with is the the amazing thing is all you're doing is giving the human body space to do its thing, right? You're like, hey, let's just like not have people talk to you. We'll cut out all the flashing lights. We'll like get rid of the hurtling metal objects that you have to try to avoid, you know, the cars on these two pedestals of legs that we have to constantly balance in a complex gravitational field. Like take away light, take away everything and just be. And an hour and a half of that, of just human beings being humans with no stresses around, is enough to like increase our like life satisfaction, our mood, our sense of like uh, physical well-being for days, which is crazy. So we keep ourselves in a state of constant, you know, often reduced, sometimes heightened stress. Uh, and it's sort of it's sort of tragic, really. So you know, whether or not it's floating, whether or not it's yeah, meditation, or just taking time to go out and and hike. And really have time away from uh, uh, the kind of daily stresses and input that's coming in constantly in the modern world. You have to, like, for your own sanity and for our sanity as a species, you have to take that time away, right? And of course, I think float tanks are kind of the quickest, most concentrated version of that because they're just designed to literally eliminate everything except yourself, right? But again, you can get there many different ways. And the, the sad thing to me is simply that um, people often aren't afraid. I mean, float tanks maybe in induce this kind of anxiety in a way that going on a hike doesn't induce anxiety, but we we're, we think we're so busy that we can't even take time off to get away from being busy, right? And as people who I know, I, I stole this completely from the, the meditation world, but I say, hey, if you don't have an hour to go float, you should probably go float for two, right? <laughs> if you, if you yeah. don't have an hour to meditate, you probably need to meditate for two hours. Is uh, Yeah, so co complete theft from that one, but it's so true. It's so true. Yeah, it really speaks to the, I don't know if importance is the right word, but just the power of solitude and, and how lacking that is and how powerful it can be just to experience a little bit of it and what a major change. And of course, being a float tank is like uh, max solitude, perhaps, where we are able to eliminate all the distractions. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, anything else you'd like to say about John Lilly while we're here? <laughs> um. That's a that's a good question. Now I got to tell some of my favorite favorite John Lilly stories. There's a, uh, I actually I'll, I'll end by telling just my my own little personal story about um, John Lilly. You know the Chapel Perilous, Robert Anton Wilson, that entire that entire side of things. And then we can we can wind down or see if you have any any questions for me after that too. Um, yeah. I'm notorious on interviews for just continuing to talk. So at some point you'll just need to cut me off. You know. So I I was rereading. This is this is years ago when I was just going to publish uh, Center of the Cyclone. Uh, for the first time and and decided to uh, to kind of get reintroduced to that text. I already read it um, once or twice before. And to kind of go back into it, I um, uh, took a hit of, of LSD, of actual like uh, Sandoz uh, LSD that I got from a, a friend, which is an awesome gift. And uh, and I just read through the entire book in, in one evening. Uh, so sat down at like 9 p.m. and then finished, I don't know, somewhere around like 3 or 4 a.m. or something like that. Uh, kind of on the tail end of my trip, which was a, a great way to, <laughs> to read through it in preparation for publishing it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard as someone who is both carrying on Lily's legacy in, in republishing his works and also carrying on his legacy in the float tank world. And, you know, this is when we're organizing the big um, float conference and, and things just kind of see, seem to be aligning in this way where we're um, in a way becoming, you know, some of the, the heads of the float tank industry and really working to uh, blast this out to the populace. And meanwhile, I'm reading these encounters that Lily is having 
you know, and I'm, I'm kind of like in this heightened sensitive state as well. And he's just talking about how when he starts pursuing float tanks, things just start going his way and all of these weird mm. things align and he just keeps meeting the right people and float tanks just keep expanding in like exactly the right direction. Um, as long as he's not pushing against it, you know, and he's like, this is, this is like Earth Coincidence Control Office wants float tanks to be spread among the people. Like, this is one of the things that they were trying to guide him to do in addition to dolphin research, right, is, is kind of pursue this floating thing, get people to be more considered, open their consciousness more, right? And here I am doing that exact same thing, reading about it, and I'm just like, at that point, it's so hard to not fall in love with that idea, right? Like, hey, I'm now acting as this agent of echo on planet earth right i also am like i hear you john lily <laughs> like here i am doing my float tank thing just like you were i'm communicating with the same entities that you were um and it's it's when things line up like that it's hard to uh and you don't even want to really look at it from a different point of view that's such a magical world to inhabit right uh and so it's interesting, like it's even as someone I would consider myself also a huge skeptic, um, largely a materialist, not in the sense that I want to, you know, own fancy cars, but that I believe in the material world around me. Um, not that I have anything against fancy cars, you know, just a uh, different kind of materialism. And it, uh, but, you know, these, the door opens and then all of a sudden there you are, you know, you're like fully in the Chapel Perilous and you're like, but what if, right? <laughs> what if John Lilly was onto something? And I am continuing this legacy, and I am, in fact, talking to the same kind of aliens that he was talking to. Um, and you have to come out the other side of that eventually and, and at least question yourself, right? Um, say, okay, whew, that was, <laughs> that was an interesting trip. It was I really, like, is this really reality? And eventually you, you kind of, when you've experienced enough or, or just if you think about it deeply enough, you have to come to the conclusion that you don't know, Right. right? That it, it is, in a sense, both is and isn't, that it might be. Uh, and you just kind of live in that space and at different points, just like in Cosmic Trigger. You know, I love that uh, Wilson doesn't refer to himself just as myself, Robert Anton Wilson. You know, it's like, and then the shaman did this, and then the entertainer mm -hmm. did this, and then the, uh, you know, scientist did this, or the skeptic did this. And it's such a better way to, to think about things, you know. So um, after that experience, I think it just really made me both understand the the seduction of that feeling of being mm. in the right synchronicities, right? Like everything seems to be happening right around you. And then as you're studying more, this especially happens when you're delving into the past of people who have felt the same things because they're describing the same, they're describing people from their past. And all of a sudden, just like with the Illuminati uh, kind of conspiracy, you have references upon references upon references and the same things like Sirius keep coming up. It's, it's because those people before you, started doing the same thing and they were digging up and they're like oh Sirius keeps coming up and the people before them did the same thing and so in a sense you're kind of going through that same historical loop just like you know as I'm reading John Lilly and tripping and thinking about the coincidences that led to me opening float tanks or um, running float tanks he's talking about these things that I also you know cyberneticists that I happen to have read 10 years ago and there's all these coincidences um, so it's just really interesting if you've never um if you've never gone through the doors of the Chapel Perilous, it is a, a very interesting place to be for a little while. And uh, I also recommend completely that you don't set up your full residence there. <laughs> and I think, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, related to John Lilly and Robert Anton Wilson, that's the, uh, yeah, that's maybe the, the ending story that I'll leave you with there. <laughs> Beautiful. And, and we've mentioned Chapel Perilous a few times. Was there a time in Lilly's life where he maybe fell into a dark place? And, and it seems like he went in and out. You know, he deliberately. But I was wondering if there was maybe a period where he got sucked in and had to find his way out. And Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, and, and it's interesting. So the, the Chapel Perilous, of course, I guess, just to go back to its roots, right, is uh, the, the chapel where there's like, it's, it's seduction, right? And um, I think it's uh, Lancelot has to come out with his, his chastity um, is the idea, which he successfully does. But the Chapel Perilous isn't like, the, the challenge isn't that there's these dangerous things that are confronting you. It's that what's on the inside is so seductive and so appealing mm. that uh, you can fall in love with it, right? And you can, you can be so seduced by being there that you, you don't come out with your chastity intact. And in fact, it kind of takes you over and, and you don't get to resume your, your previous life. Um, so, you know, I think that's the origin of, of Wilson using that. And, and certainly Lily, I, to my knowledge, never used that term. But yeah, in different, in his own words, certainly, you know, so much of his life was spent saying, hey, I, I truly feel 
that I had these experiences where I'm talking to aliens and where they're telling me things, you know, much like Wilson talks about, that are going to happen in the future, and then those things more or less come to pass. Mm. How am I? How am I to not believe in this? You know. And then at other points, he says, "Hey, it was kind of crazy that I believed in those things. I understood why I would, but there's these other much more rational explanations for it." And it's hard to say, you know, to some degree, I think in his writing, he's bouncing back between this um, scientist view and the the shaman view in a, in a certain sense for his reader, like knowing that his reader is not going to be on that same plane with him always for the shaman journey. But I also think that he was kind of like flopping back and forth between that him, himself throughout his entire life. You know, it was it's hard to tell the difference um, between uh, reality and fiction, you know, much less when you're talking about things that only happen. Um, in our own mind, as our experience of the entire world is is only in our own head. So, no, I think he was always questioning himself. Um, I do think by the end of his life, he had, he had really come to the conclusion that he he had in fact been communicating with these you know other universes, been traveling to them, been in communication with aliens. But um, having read so much of his work, it it uh, it seems highly unlikely to me that there wasn't always some form of that skepticism, right? Where he says, "Hey." You know, in, in Wilson's words, like, it, it, is this really what's going on? Or did I just get totally seduced by, like, I went too deep into the Chapel Perilous and I haven't actually found my way out yet, you know, and I'm just too ensconced in my own belief set that I then haven't transcended in the right way. So, no, I think, I think there's always that questioning and that um, wanting to see what's behind the veil. But then whenever, you, you know, you're presented with an image, not trusting what that image is, but still it's so intriguing when you hit those heightened states and are able to go to those different levels it's hard not to and they can be such strong emotional impacts on you it's hard in a certain sense to to question that experience so now i think like so much of his life was um spent almost you know yeah kind of journeying um journeying between those realms of skepticism and full belief yeah right yeah i like that skepticism and full belief that's what came up for me as you were speaking is just if you're going to go into this experience with full belief certain experiences it would be easy to develop a god complex or whatever it is and uh, get seduced by that higher consciousness experience and then if you don't have that wherewithal to bring the skeptic back in after the fact and start taking it apart you could really go off the rails and develop that god complex or whatever it is and think that you know you are the chosen one versus you oh, know no this is just a state of consciousness and experience yeah and who knows which is better right i'm sure that yeah at different points you're like hey maybe it's better to almost have a god complex and like live right. in this regular world right um there's certainly no um yeah no what right or wrong way to to have your beliefs but i do think yeah in lily's case and and for a lot of people yeah even even like myself who kind of have a scientific background but have found their way into a little more esoteric way of, of existence and, and consideration of our own thought process. Um, yeah, drawing that line even is very, very difficult for which one of those you're inhabiting at a given moment. Yeah. Yeah, something about having a sense of humor seems to come up for me around just <laughs> being or like, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, maybe this isn't as serious as I thought it was and I need to let go of this belief system and humor being a great way to create some space between the belief system you've taken on and yeah, separate yourself from it. Absolutely. Yeah, and that certainly comes out even more in Wilson than it does in Lily. But Lily had a, an incredibly keen sense of humor. I just, from uh, from hanging out with so many people who in turn, you know, hung out with John Lily, it seems like much of that came out in his uh, conversation and interaction with other people and less, um, at least like less pungently than, than Wilson in his writings, right? Um, yeah, uh, Wilson, of course, is kind of a a cosmic clown in a, in a certain sense, which I, which I absolutely love about him. Um, yeah. All right. Well, Graham Talley, let's see, what can we find you on the web? What would you, you have a book publishing and a float center and a float development company, if I understand correctly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We also did a, a yearly, if you want to, if you want to know more about running a float tank center, we have a, a, a year of podcasts where we did a different silly intro song every single day, speaking of being silly. So if you look me up online, I mean, that's really what I recommend is listen to all the silly intros. The content is just there to distract people, but that's a fun, <laughs> a fun thing to find. So it's called the Daily Solutions Podcast. No, um, yeah, I mean, really more than the, the, the things that I do are much more geared again towards the, the float industry specifically. Um, but yeah, if people want to look up the, the books and publishing, you can always just look up, um, you know, John Lilly on Amazon. You'll find the books that we've put out there. Um, we have a, an actual website, which is 
barely maintained, so don't don't judge me too harshly on it. Called uh, yeah, coincidencebooks.com, but our our publishing company is called Coincidence Control Publishing. Perfect um, for for obvious reasons. Yeah, yeah. Other than that, if you want to reach out, uh, yeah, you can find my email. If you if you if you're really interested, you can find my email posted all over the web. So just do a little search for Graham Tally, and you can uh, you can figure out how to get a hold of me. All right, we'll put those links in the show notes, and been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. Thanks so much for having me on. It was a, it was a total pleasure and a nice, uh, yeah, nice introduction to Cosmic Trigger too. I've read Wilson before, but nice to uh, have another book to go through in preparation. Yeah, and I really want to express my gratitude for putting these books out there, especially like programming and metaprogramming, which had gone dormant for twenty five years, and so it was really delightful to pick that up and be able to read it and. Uh, continue to see these works in print and around. I'm looking forward to picking up The Scientist. I haven't read that one. so Yeah, yeah. Hopefully our hardcover will be coming out soon. It was uh, getting close and then this whole pandemic thing just threw everything for a loop. So upcoming, but date date uncertain on that one. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. Um, yeah, really appreciate you putting on this podcast as well. I listened to uh, the other episodes also leading up to this. I meant to listen to one just in preparation, then got hooked and listened oh, to all of them. So you're, you're doing a really great job. And, you know, a lot of these thinkers, again, have just kind of been disowned or, or ignored by, um, you know, both the, the scientific world around them when, when they were writing and as a result, just not passed on to a current generation at all accurately. So I think you're doing a lot of really good stuff to introduce people to um, thinkers that are both very prominent, but largely unknown, which uh, should, should pretty much never be the case. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, to me, it seems like these folks are just so far ahead of their time that they get lost in the cracks. And it's, it's great to try and bring them up and dust them off and present them to the world again. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, yeah, thank you again and can't wait to listen to uh yeah, listen to the next episodes after this one. All right, that concludes our episode. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. A big thank you to Graham Talley for taking the time to talk with us. You can find Graham at coincidencebooks.com as well as floathq.com. Thank you to Christina Pearson and Richard Ross of Hilaritas Press, and thank you to our engineer Ryan Reeves for putting it all together. Our next episode on Bucky Fuller will release on the 23rd of March. Until then, I am your host, Mike Gathers, signing off with love and cheerfulness. Amor e Hilaritas. Science is a yoga too.